Hey, it's Chief Bonnie with Board Games. It's Ham Tag. Ham Tag. Hey. Woo! Half as much, twice as good. That's right. Half we're as here. much, yes. twice as good. We got Judd. We got Mr. T. All right. And we're going to be doing top five games from 2010 to present. 2010 to present. Do you want to explain here. a little more on that? Or do you want to? No, go, go. If it's from 2010 to now, well, it's eligible. But, but why are we doing <laughs> why? this? Why are we doing this one? Well, we kicked around an idea about doing best of the decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever. And Greg said, "Let's start with this one." It said, and then the idiot. reason I, you know, the reason I think we need to do this one is because there's, we get a lot of comments that a lot of the games we pick are of a older vintage, and you know, we're not really just hung up on the old games. We do play new games too, and we thought we'd start with you know ones that are at least this new. Mm -hmm. So from 2010 till now, perfect. Why don't you kick us off? All right, um, and I just want to say this this topic was really one of the hardest ones for me that we've ever done because usually you know people make comments about how can we limit it to five. I usually don't have a problem because you know we pick a particular genre. And then it's just, well, these are the games in there, so come up with a reason why this one is better than this one. But this one was like apples, oranges, and bananas. I mean, there were so many games to choose from and no way to really pick between them. Mm -hmm. So I know that all of the games are going to be good. So what I just went with for my criteria is the personal experiences I had with the different games. And so my number five... Uh, of the top five games from 2010 till now is Hands in the Sea, the first Punic War. It came out in 2016. Um, it's a, a deck builder game. You've got you've got ships, you've got land, you've got to politically control the areas. I know Judd, you know, as it was coming out, talked about how at that time it was his favorite game. The reason why this is in my top five is because this got me to like deck builder games. Deck builder games to me often don't have a strong enough theme, but this one really did. Even though it's not a pure deck builder, you don't do all of your cards, you just do a couple of actions. But the other thing I like about it and and have liked about it are the different pathways you can get to victory. You can focus on military, you can focus on building your own things up, you can focus on raiding and pillaging. So this gives a lot of options and uh, every game I've had has just been been fun. I mean, they don't always go the distance. Sometimes there is a, a, a quick victory. But Hands in the Sea is my number five of the top games from 2010 till now. I like it. Hmm. Very good. Keeping my own theme of basic games, not Stratego, but Risk, but it's Risk Legacy. So Rob Davio, and I always forget... <laughs> And I don't hear him mentioned often, but he's in here. Chris, I think it's Dupus? I don't know. D-U-P-U-I-S. I, I even made sure I spelled it right. 2011. Came out in 2011. Um, it's Risk. But it's the beginning of Legacy Games, where the game morphs and changes, and it's destructible. And there's a little, uh, think like an express package envelope, where you zip it open, and there's hidden little compartments and things go in and stickers go on the board and you can morph things in a different way and it led to so much more and I've actually got a group uh, and it could also be the negative of this it really has to be the same it doesn't have to be but it's way more fun if you have the same group of folks come over you sign the board you do the thing you name continents and I think in college <laughs> it would have been great well I would have torn through two of these at the current stage, it's like, oh, every three months we get in a set of three games. But I like it for what it is. It's still definitely a risk. But as we can tell, there's a wave of legacy or legacy-ish games that have come out. And this was the beginning, and I can't believe it came from Hasbro. Question. Um, I never liked risk because the games go on forever. Right. But don't these only take like two hours per session not, or something? Sometimes not even that. They're a okay. lot quicker because you can do all your moves uh, to the extent that you stop when you want or you can't move anything else because you can only move like an army once. And and when you're invading a territory, actually that's not even true because when you're invading, you can keep pushing. It's not just one and done. Mm -hmm. 
and so you collapse in on each other much faster and and you're at conflict quicker my sister loves risk the original risk and yeah. i got her that for christmas and i think that's probably her all-time favorite game she hmm. loved she got cool. a group and they played it and it's good they game. really got into it i, I like mean, it cool hats and everything okay my cool number hats. they bought hats yeah oh yeah i think she got like a macarthur <laughs> hat <laughs> sorry that caught me this year cool hats and everything and i was like yeah yeah and i'm it's like, like wait, cosplay wait. and war cool. games didn't mean yeah, yeah i was like what do you mean cool hats i was like oh yeah sure and then i was like wait hats okay my number five <laughs> is hearts and minds um published by worthington in 2010 something about this list when we were making it i have a thing i do of top top tens it's if you want to see it it's on my profile on bgg and it's stuff that either we've done in the past and i wanted to expand it to 10 or stuff i don't think we'll ever do personally i think that's cheating and we should give them the merits <laughs> yeah <laughs> i believe you're breaking a ham tag wall it's twice as much half as good <laughs> i call it like a fifth as much <laughs> uh, a third as much a tenth as good or something i had some cool acronym but anyways when we were doing this I found out 2010 was so incredible. I could have done a great top five list just off of that year. So I did a top 10 list on just 2010 and put the comment while well, researching a ham tag potential thing. Anyway, so yeah, this came out in 2010. Uh, Worthington published it. It's a card driven game of the Mark Herman type with the operation points. Um, if you want to know a lot more about the details, go to our top five uh, post World War II games. This was in there. Um, love the game because it's incredibly flexible. You can play one turn, you can play 11 turns, different setups, different endings. The game progressively gets worse for the Americans as the dove the dove meter keeps getting worse. But what's cool is, you know, hey, you want to play a 10 turn game, you have to stop at five, something happens, just go to victory conditions and you can stop at any time. Um, so it's it plays really smooth, real easy game. Um, there was a second edition put out. What I think what happened was the one complaint about this was the map's too small. It's I mean it's not too small, but it's smaller than it should be, and the tables are in the rule books. There's like ten page rule book, and a fan made a big like twenty four by thirty six map blown up with all the tables on it, mm -hmm. and then posted on BGG. It's still out there, and. Um, they Worthington took it, made a mounted board. I've heard the mounted, but it's not a GMT mounted board. It was one of their earlier attempts. But um, anyways, they published that as a second edition. I went out, took that file. I just did it like last month. Went to posterprintfactory.com. You can go to Zazos or whatever they call those. And I got the thing. I just submitted it, got it, come in the mail, 20 bucks with shipping. And, you know, laid out really thick, good quality stuff. So if you have the first edition and want that, it's a great way. But anyways, really, really slick, and it plays quite a bit different than a lot of your card-driven games when you get the points. You spend a point. It's not like I'm going to activate this general. It's I'm going to, I can spend a point to move this guy, then spend a point to fire, and spend a point to have another round, and spend a point to do this, or, do and hats? you can bake them. Do you have hats? If you want a hat. Just checking. But yeah, um, um, so <laughs> a really slick system. And anyways, that's my number five. Okay, my number four. This one is from 2011, is Sekigahara, The Unification of Japan. This is a, a really elegant block game on the Battle of Sekigahara 600 AD, 1600, I'm sorry, 1600 AD. Um, the reason why this is on my list, the, the personal connection I've got, is there are two sides in this game, you know, the Tokugawa clan and the Ishida clan, and it took me several plays to finally come up with the strategy for how to use the reinforcements that um, I now have a strategy that I can win with the Ishida side. It was, you know, my knowledge of the game kind of uh, evolved, and that's why this is in my top five. The unique thing about this one is it uses cards. It's, it's hidden block information that shows there's there's really not uh, much strength information on the blocks, but what clan it is is important because the deck is used, the number of cards you play determines how many units can move, and the type of cards you have in your hand uh, decide who can attack. So that's what makes this game a really unique thing. Um, when I, I've played it before at WBC, the World Board Gaming Championships, and the way the tournament gets run there, you get to play five games in a day, and that's 
a fun time. Hmm. So Sekigahara is my uh, number four best top game from it's from 2011. My number four is A Few Acres of Snow, Martin Wallace. This game could maybe even be a little higher on my list, but it is where it is. I played around with where I was going to put it. I haven't played it as much since we were playing it at church all the time. Mm -hmm. What I love about this game, what I still love about this game, was there were so many... It's a deck-building game um, where the deck-building is designed to show that you can't do exactly what you want to do when you want to do it. If you wanted to get more troops, you had to sometimes call back to France and get those troops to be put on a ship and come your way. And it really functioned in that mode where there was a delay factor of what you were wanting to do. <coughs> um, and I would, we would play, and I would think, well, that was awesome. What if I had tried this whole different strategy and the next time we would play I would try that and then I would think you know what let me try this whole thing with forts I never did try the Halifax hammer I'm sure <laughs> it could be I never used. done it we never use it we had a ball with it as far as a fun game goes I had a lot a lot of fun with this game mm -hmm. a few acres of snow 2011 Martin Wallace and I just want to because that reminded me, um, I have recently played, there's a new one out from GMT called Time of Crisis, mm -hmm. which is the Roman Empire, which is another deck builder game. The thing that is unique about that is, you know, this has the different kind of cards for the locations and sometimes for additional troops and things like that. This one, there are three classes of cards, military, political, and I can't Senate. remember what. Senate or population. Something like that, yeah. But blue, red, and yellow yeah. cards. But you buy those cards and you have to do, you know, if you've got a handful of red cards, you can only do military things. And But the same thing what you mentioned happens is uh, I've got these these five cards. It's a traditional deck builder. I've got these five cards. Well, I can do something with these four, but there's nothing I can do with this card. Mm. And, you know, so that ends up clogging your hand for this turn. And then next turn, it's like, man, I, I can't do what I want to do. Mm. But it does it with even more generic cards than that one does. It's it's an interesting system. I'm uh, Like I said, I've only played it a couple times now, but Looking forward to playing it some more. I've said a lot. What I like about Martin Wallace's war games is I'm not a Yuragamer by and large. I'll play him, but it's not my thing. <laughs> but he takes a war game and takes an aspect of it, not going for the simulation, but he'll take an aspect and study it, and he'll put this really cool Euro thingy in it and give you a really cool game out of it that's different from all the other war games you saw. In this one, he was focusing on the long supply line, and he used the deck builders that you that was coming out, okay. or whatever that big deck builder thing was. It was out Dominion. Of Dominion, mm -hmm. yeah. Put his spin and created a pretty cool game. That's what I always like. I'm not real big on his Euros outside of automobile, but I love his war games for the Euro thing. It's okay. cognitive dissonance. Great. It's finest. My number four. Okay. My number four is Hold the Line, Frederick Swore. Uh, Worthington published this in 2013. Sean Chick's the designer. Um, Hold the Line, one of my all-time favorites. American Revolution is m my, my topic, but this, I think, is the better game. That tells you something. It's using the same system. Why this is better is the scenarios are more tightly balanced. Uh, if, you, if you played a Command and Colors game, one of the little annoying things is each side, whoever gets the six victories, wins. And one side has no prayer of making six. So you, the idea is you switch sides. This and the hold the line games enter where one side's on a timer. So yeah, he ha the, usually the stronger side has to win within so many turns. The other guy either scores so many or holds out. This one, it might be you have to score five. I only have to score three or hold out until such and such a turn. So these are very tightly balanced. He also put a few spins into the hold the line system and it makes it a whole lot more fun. And I knew nothing about, I didn't know who Frederick the Great was. Um, I When I saw the War of Austria and Secession, I thought, well, what country did Austria secede from? 
I didn't know it was about to do with royalty and succession in the royal succession. Line. Yeah, succession. So I knew no everything I learned at the time was from this game. He has real cool. But I mean, if you know Sean Chick, check his geek list out. He's they're awesome history backgrounds. He does these. Um, anyway, so everything I learned is from here. He gets great backgrounds on the battles. I learned a whole lot from this, and. Um, I, I don't know if, um, I think it's out of print, but I don't think it's that hard to get. I, I wish Worthington would have put more oomph behind it, more promotion, because it is an excellent game. And to tell you how much of a fan base this has, one of the fans has created 17 additional scenarios on the war for Spanish secession. I've never heard of it. They didn't succeed. It spilled like the royalty one. And the Seven Years War. So there is a ton of game. There's a lot in here, and then there's a whole lot of more fan created. Um, if you like the system, he's upgraded and put a spin. It. It's out now. It's called Horse and Musket Donovan Era. It's a little more musket and pike, but it's it's with um, the, oh, the guys who did the Agricola, not the Euro game. Um, oh, yeah. Holland, I can't pronounce her name. Anyways, um, yeah, Horse and Musket Donovan Air. Check it out because he's creating a series where it's going to go all the way up to the Civil War. So if you missed your chance, it's hard to find. You can still get it. But anyways, excellent game. This thing's always in my top 20 every year. I make my top 100. Love this game. Can't get enough of it. Um, before Two things before you go on. Okay. You mentioned that fanboys have made 17 scenarios for that. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring in ASL. Oh yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you know, there are fan groups out there that have made hundreds of scenarios for ASL. So, and the other thing is, I think I saw an offer where they had a, a two pack of Frederick's war and a W1815, both for sale for $22. So sure. you might want to, I think everybody uh, got that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you didn't get that? No. Actually, what, that one like of the things Black that got Friday me... Sale. I think, yeah. Yeah, it was, they couldn't sell them. They were yeah. trying to clear them out. <laughs> um, when this game came out, there was a deal where you, there's a Jacobite Rebellion um, expansion that goes with this. I still think okay. we need to come and back to get the Black free. Friday deal. Yeah. See, the whole thing is he's been trying to find that game. W1815. Right. Yeah, when Greg mentioned that video, I thought to myself, I've got six weeks to find this. The second right. bar puts it out, it's going to yeah, go through We're the trying roof. to call it... Uh, I, I like to call it ham tagged oh cool. ham -tagged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if, if you if your game's been ham tagged you're going to sell an extra 22 of them excellent but, yeah when i mean when these when this wasn't part of kickstarter usually worthy to put it out they give it 250 back or so i don't know what they're making 500 or so games versus the thousands yeah. of years of it. but yeah. just for such a tight group pretty rabid fan base besides just yeah. me making the vassal module i mean this so you hear the talk and you hear people talking about it favorably a lot yeah mm. Okay, my number three, I mentioned it before, this is from 2013, Rebel Raiders on the High Seas. This is a grand strategy, the American Civil War, but it focuses on the naval aspects, taking the forts and uh, uh, various forts and ports on the Mississippi River, the raiders, the blockade runners, you know, ground combat comes into play, but very abstractly. The reason why this is on my favorite list is because I played in the uh, tournament at the World Board Gaming Championships a few years back when it was a sanctioned event, and we went to 1 o'clock in the morning trying to get it finished, and it, it ended up with me on the last turn, I had to take, uh, I think it was Richmond and Atlanta both, and took one of them, didn't take the other one, but I mean, it was a, a very good close game. Um, it's a card assisted game. You don't need your cards to do the attack, but they will they will increase the odds of your attack or they will uh, recognize a particular raider or a gunboat uh, on the Mississippi and you know so you get an extra effect for that turn. although some cards like Longstreet, Lee, Grant, once they come in, they're there for the duration hmm. unless yeah. So, Rebel Raiders on the High Seas is my number three game. Comes from 2013. Stacks askew, but my number three is 1775. It's one of the Birth of America or the American Revolution, but it's the Birth of America so, series. All right, right. It won't. I've got the. Uh, what is the game you built on the video? I think there was one where they all dumped out. Then they came out with, and I. Think, oh, you're right, it may not be this one. The the newer versions have you, it's got a tray that you break apart 
And then it's got these slip covers that kind of go on over top. Because, yeah, I think I probably did just spill, just judging by the sound of it. Uh, so here's the deal. Bo Beckett and Jeff Stahl, uh, through Academy Games, it's a really super light Euro-ish war game. Um, you, you're, you're able to – your dice are, are built to kind of – if you're the red coach, you're not going to run as much as, say, American Militia one. Um, but it, it, is, it is so – uh, user friendly. It's easy to get folks that aren't war gamers into it. And out of the system, this is the favorite game uh, for me because the the way the British can jump into colonies in different areas, you're you're fighting, you're you're at each other's throats right away, and it really has that feel to it. Um, it has that real strong melee-ish feel to it. So. 1775. One thing, um, what, I'm curious about your opinion uh, on how does it scale to different numbers of players. Yeah. I felt I'm, it didn't scale very well. I always play it two-player. Okay, I like, two. Yeah, I like, I, I'm not as patient with it. I think if I had, a, if I had like, uh, if Bo and some of his buddies wanted to play, I could easily say, hey, you're going to be running these guys. Uh, and then the only kicker you got to explain is, hey, you can you can move that whole army group in that territory, but you got to have one of your color in there in order to maneuver them. Okay. So you got to kind of make sure they know how to spread okay. their guys out a little bit. If they're just massing their troops, they're doomed. They okay. got to be able because that way your your co your your okay. your partner. fellow partner can move your troops as okay. well. So. But yeah, I've I, I yeah. think I've always and played so, two players. Okay, so it plays well. Uh, three is probably a little wonky, but yeah, four four player games, you know, coin games, you know, unless you got the bots working well, coin the counterinsurgency series games don't really scale well to three. Okay, a company I think I'm trying to remember, I think it's Hollenspiel or something. I mm -hmm. I probably butchered it if you saw me do Bordino or whatever that and they're in Bordino. the French. Yeah. Bordino. So who I knows how it's really pronounced, Bordino. but it looks like Hollenspiel. Hollen and Spiel. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. It was good to know that you have Canadians that come through your office and you have your maps out and you, and, and you start asking them, How do I say that? What is you? Yeah. Yeah. How do I say this? I really thought that you one was Illinois. It looked like it was Illinois, but it's really not. <laughs> it's a e e I L L A U X. Anyways, sure, anyways, sure. I got them like phonetically written down, and I stuck them inside of my game. Okay, my number. What are we on? Three. Is yeah. Operation Battle Axe, and last time we did this, I screwed. I don't. Is whether it's Wavel or Wavel versus Rommel. Um, it's in the desert, 1941. It's co-produced by. Take Aim Designs and Revolution Games. They've done uh, three games so far. In many ways, it is a what I would call a perfect game. The reason it's perfect is you can buy it on the Revolution website. It's in print, $27. They always put them on sale in the fall also. Storage, not difficult at all. This is $27? Yeah. Um, it is, um, and I think they put around like 20, around 20 in the fall on their sales. Um, nine pages of rules, very clearly written. Designers extremely active on ConSim World and Board Game Geek. I don't know what you'd have a question about, but if you did, he's very active because it's very clear. 10 minutes to set it up, less than two hours to play it. Charles Keebler artwork, excellent artwork on this thing. Um, area Impulse Game. The reason I pick this over some of the others and I've won, I love Area Impulse. I've had tons of these on the list. The reason, I've wondered what is my favorite Area Impulse game. It might very well be this. It's this or Breakout Normandy. And the reason why I like this one better than the others, that on these Area Impulse, it's usually one side has the advantage, they're the attackers, the other side has the train advantage and the timer on their side. In this one, the British start off and they're trying to relieve Tobruk. They come out, they come out throwing punches. I mean, and then once the Panzers get released and Rommel's there, they start to come back. The British are trying to score so many victory points. They try to jump out there and grab them and then hold them. So each side swinging. And that's something you don't see in a lot of these games. And like I said, fast setup, fast takedown, cheap, I mean, relatively cheap. And in many ways, it's a perfect game. And I just put out my top hunt. I think it was number 11 or 12. I mean, it's, I love this game. Uh, so no was, need to go look at his top 100. He's telling you where they're at. <laughs> You're supposed to tease it. 
No. Like it's high. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my number two is 1989 Dawn of Freedom. This is about the downfall of communism in the various uh, Eastern European countries, Romania and Nikolai Ceausescu, and maybe pronounce those right, uh, East Germany, thing, Poland. Um, this is really the most direct offspring from Twilight Struggle because it handles control and domination the same way. The scoring is very similar, except that uh, before you actually score a country, there's a power struggle round where you're trying to just get eat, eat the last points of support out. Uh, it's, it's a card, match the card. Now I play a card and you have to match my card. Uh, mechanic that goes into that. The first, the reason why this is on my top list is the 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 thing that happened in this game is you can have as is I was behind as a communist and then I scored. I cannot remember which country. I think it was East Germany, but I won the power struggle, which gave me a few victory points. I stayed in power, which gave me more victory points. I took some. Uh, presence away from my opponent as a result of the power struggle so his points went down and then I ended up winning the scoring so you can have huge point swings in this game which a lot of people don't like but it just means you have to play to handle those so this is it's 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 not exactly Twilight Struggle but it's close enough if you know Twilight Struggle you'll know this and it, it feels a little more immediate instead of being the whole world it just how, I mean, I'm trying to control this country and I as the Democrats are trying to knock you know once um, once you knock the communists out of power you're not going to score that that area again until possibly the end of the game so you know you, you can achieve things as you go along so 1989 Dawn of Freedom is my number two game this came from 2012 how important is deck memorization as compared to like Twilight Struggle or Washington's War not as important but the interesting thing it, it's good you brought that up because I had it in my notes it the deck memorization there are uh, some cards that are important it doesn't feel like as many you know in a yeah, there's no deck memorization in Washington's yeah. War. That's oh, giving you some extremes. I, I'm looking for some ones. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, in Twilight Struggle, it's important. There are more cards, I think, that you have to remember. But the interesting thing here is you 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 feel like it's it's the same mechanic. If I play your event, it I get the points, but you get the event. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it happens even more in this game. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of times you'll have a fish, and every one of them will be the other guys. I think that's because there are fewer neutral cards. So when you, you know, you might want to play your event, but, you know, where this might be a neutral card that doesn't affect either, now it's your event. So you, you, en you end up learning, you don't have to memorize the deck as much, but you, you learn how to handle the other guy's events even more than you do in Twilight Struggle. Okay. Hmm. That's, that's the big difference there that I've found. My number two is Gladiator Quest for the Rudis. 2016 release from Jane Trunzo, who also did Title Bell. And it's a diceless tactical gladiator game where you very much like Title Bell, you flip the card the fast action deck and yep yeah, and you see where you're looking at that card matters on what you're doing so you might be resolving the wound or you might be checking to see if you're fall you've fallen down or or if you've i think there's a spear i can't even remember or the trident um the only sad thing for me on this um i got through the rule book fine and it might have been because we'd even recently played title bout we oh yeah title bout even at even at church, and uh, and I that had, sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor's giving a like, sermon. We're back like here. Bam! Whatever I, I can. do, I do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I like to just say we. I went, just don't you church. talk about that during yeah. your scotch yeah. tasting too? That's right. You know, I was tasting yeah, scotch, scotch at church. church. And go ahead. <laughs> hey, we're in the lobby, by the way, while the you know, uh, kids are doing their thing. Sanctuary, smoking, yeah, smoking. Right. Yeah. That's right. Um, 
the, the rule book wasn't probably as clean as it could have been. Um, I didn't suffer from problems, but a lot of people didn't find things to be as intuitive. Um, James did have uh, an expansion that he was hoping to do if this went well, in my understanding, although I believe there might have been a death with the publisher as well, or somebody that worked with the system somewhere, and it just didn't go as far as I wish it would have gone because they had teased out all these different types of uh, Roman fighting systems that, that I was really looking forward to. Um, I, I played it with Bo, he grasped it quickly. Um, they, they had the feel of their different, you know, the light armored, I can't remember all their names. Yeah, and that, yeah. And Trident, and uh, um, just really had the The one feel. deck handles all the different types of no, Maybe you do have different decks. Okay. So when you're heavy, okay. you've got a little bit different deck okay. than, yeah. Which so is a little slower, but a little... I would have to... Yeah, okay. I don't remember. Yes. Okay. There is... This is like the dice deck. I don't know what they call it, but they have the common attacks, melee, and then you have some different modifiers based okay. on your type. Okay, yeah. So, and some people thought the board was extremely boring because it was basically sand. <laughs> so Which I thought it was if, if you've ever played to Brook, you'd really like that. <laughs> there yeah. you go, yes. Alrighty. Two. My number two is Festoon Europa from Compass Games. It came out 2016, still in print, still available. Uh, Mike Grinella, who also I didn't mention it, Operation Battle Axe. He's the designer on this. Um, this is a card-driven game that, when I say Mark Kerman style operation points, just so you know it's not upfront or memoir type. Um, this is one of those games I've been waiting for my whole life. Um, it's, to me, it's kind of hard to make a really good game from Operation Husky onward because, gee, I don't want to be the Germans. That would kind of suck. Example, I got West Front, which uses by Columbia, uses the same system as East Front. Great mechanics. I traded West Front. thought it was boring because one side just gets beat up on all the time. So how do you pull it off? This one, it part of it, it has the historical events in there. You can try for Valkyrie. I actually did. I was screaming to BGG, I killed Hitler! Um, so um, anyway, so it has those in there. You can also, it has, ver it has cool variant ideas in there. You can try to launch D-Day in 1943. You can try... Roundup, which it gives you the option to either go for France or go up through Norway. Very difficult to do. Or you can take the more safe, conservative route and take the Husky card. One of the two you'll take in your hand to start and take the more traditional route. Um, it has the events in there. You're managing air units, um, reserves, bombers, whether you want to bomb their infrastructure, try to use it for carpet bombing um, on their oil reserves or limit their hands. That is a, the allies are a little trickier to play because you got to balance these resources. Um, the, so yeah, um, one of the complaints I see is that, you know, it feels like, well, I'm just wasting cards in Italy. You're really not. If you don't think so, just send those troops to France and watch them roll right up through Italy and hit you from the soft underbelly. Um, so it has that aspect, and yes, it will bog down in Italy just like it did up around Rome, and it has the Anzio invasion in there. So, um, but it has the events, you push in to get D-Day, you struggle once you get up near the Rhine. Extremely balanced game. Usually when I play this thing, it comes down to one or two victory points and you're racing the Russians who aren't in this game, but they are figured into the game. I'm not gonna go into it. Um, but it's extremely tight. And if it's something you're into, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I just flip for this game. It's, it's, I mean, it's always in my top 10. I love this game. And it uses, I didn't say when I said card driven, it's using the Paz of Glory system, but it's extremely simplified. One of the things about Paz of Glory I don't like is how fiddly it is and how scripted it is. Um, the, you can't play two cards for, one card for reinforcement return, two for, you can't play back to back cards for replacement points, stuff like that. That's all gone. None of that's in here. When you play replacement points, you take them immediately. So it's very smooth. It's, it's only like 10, 12 pages of rules, really clear. Um, so it's, it's just very, very stripped down. And it's, it's kind of in the part, a second part of the trilogy. Shifting Sands was the first. Mike was a play tester on Barbarossa to Berlin. Knew the parts he liked and didn't like. Put him into Shifting Sands, which I, I adore that game, but it wasn't part of this decade. Um, 
hint for the spoiler. future. Yeah, spoiler. <laughs> um, but this one's more stripped down, and the third one, which should come out someday, I hope he's watching this, Clash of Tyrants, Clash of Tyrants, I bug him all the time about it, is going to be the Eastern Front. Hmm. So anyways, that is my number two, Festing Europa. Okay. Yeah, because as you were describing it, I was flashing back to Barbarossa to Berlin, mm -hmm. which but I did not know that there was an evolution. It, oh, it also has, I just said, it has hexes on it, too. Right. Okay, my number one game from 2010 till now is from 2010, and it is Labyrinth, The War on Terror. Um, the reason why this is on my list is because one weekend I was down with my uh, wife's cousin, and we played eight games in one weekend, just basically back to back. As soon as we finished one, it was let's start it again, and we never got tired of it. I mean, it was it's this is a uh, again a card driven game. People say it's it's Twilight Struggle, but it's really not Twilight Struggle because you know there's a lot more limitations on what you can do. You know, you might want to move troops into an area but you can't move them in until you've made them an ally. Um, you know, the, the, the jihadists might want to get cells over into uh, North America, but you can't just put them there. You have to somehow get, get used to get a cell or try to move them there, which may or may not succeed. Um, the thing one of the mechanics I do like about this, and it's not used in any other card-driven games that I know of, is your turn is playing two cards. So that lets you do a little mini planning with your hand. You know, I can, I can set up something with this card and then play this card before the other guy can react. So you can't do anything big, big strategic moves like that, but there's just little, little plans that you can do. There is an expansion out for this now, uh, Labyrinth the Awakening, uh, and it adds some things. It adds an awakening mechanic and a reaction mechanic that makes uh, the War of Ideas, which is how the uh, U.S. player converts countries to his way of thinking, and the reaction affects jihad efforts by the jihadist player to get them to turn to Islamist rule, and it increases the efficiency of those. So it, it adds a new mechanic, doesn't really change the game all that much. It, I'll play either one. You know, one hasn't replaced the other. So this is my number one game from 2010 until now, Labyrinth, The War on Terror. You know what's cool on that, that two-card mechanic also is that you can mitigate the opponent's event because the opponent's event will kick in, just like in Twilight Struggle. But it might say, this is going to happen if this case happens. You play the first card to neutralize what would right, trigger that card. that can card. happen, right. I mean, there's a space race mechanism in there, but there's also more ways to do it. And that game, I think, has the greatest, one of the greatest player aids I've ever seen. I haven't played that game for years, and I can pick it up really quickly just because the player aid tells you exactly how to do the different steps. It's a you know, great rule book. That would be... A good video. Good. The game. What are the top five player aids? Except mm. I don't know of any for Stratego. Uh, dang. <laughs> I just kind of spoiled my number one. <laughs> you need to make one of those. <laughs> one, one of your special one page. There you go. One oh, page Stratego. Something else on Labyrinth. I was playing a, for a guy on Vassal on that, and I won on the third card of the game. Oh, ran out of cells. I was the American. Yeah, I took ran a cell. Out cells. I got yeah. the, the drone and I took. I, was, I did an action I to take think, a cell. How can you do that? But that's right. You can he just sat, kill he sat cells. there dumbfounded. Like, did, did I just win the game? I think I did. That's a mistake yeah. you only make once. Yes. Huh. Yes. Well, close to Stratego. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Conflict of Heroes: Awakening the Bear, 2012, Uva Eichert Academy Games. This is what launches Academy Games, I believe. Um, where, why this is special for me. I've talked about Conflict of Heroes before, but this is special for me because as a kid, 1983, I get into war games, predominantly solitaire. Buy a lot, play a lot. Uh, as I get older, I kind of, I kept them around, but they were boxed up. 2006, uh, wife and I start to get into the, the Euro games that come out, Ticket to Ride and Carcassonne and all these games that are coming out. 
and I was not back into really wargaming, this comes out, and I, I'm pretty darn sure I was at BGG Con when I even, I was actually, I played it for the first time at, at one of the first or second BGG Cons I was at. And because I'd saw it, I was like, wow, I love World War II, and what is this? And it was so easy to play. The pieces were so much larger than what I, you know, had as a kid. And it, and the maps were gorgeous. This is second edition where they've, the maps are even prettier. They're photorealistic. So that is why it's my number one. Uh, came out 2012, and uh, I just love World War II tactical combat. And I also really like the nod that, you know, not not that the Eastern Front gets ignored, but in a lot of tactical games, you get West Front, West Front, and to to have the, the really the first and the second game. Second game is uh, Storm uh, Storm, of, Storm of Steel, which is Curse forty three on. Um, the well, we won't get into, but great game. So that's my number one. Mm -hmm. My number one game is Washington Screaming in the Sea. It's put out by GM Knight Worthington. Came out in 2010, 11, 16. Designed by Mark Kronberger. <laughs> when we made this list, when Greg came up with the idea, I said, I go, oh man, Washington's War was 2010. I said, my list is predictable. I said, anybody watch these knows me, knows Washington's War, Hands in the Sea, and Band of Brothers are all going to be right there. And wow, that's going to be kind of boring. How many times have I talked about those games? So I'm cheating. I have a three way tie for first place. So I could talk about some other games and give them some exposure. Um, you can watch okay. any number of games. Uh, Games about America, uh, top five games of all time. They're all in there if you want to know more about the games. Love them all. Um, that's my number one, Washington Screaming in the Sea. Okay, but let me ask you this. If, if you have a player that knows all three games mm. and, you know, let's play something and you pick, which one would you pick? Are they good at all of them? They're good at all. Washington's War. Okay. Well, I, I never. Right. My problem when I played on Vassal is I'd always have to teach people, and I could just womp them mm. either side. Or I love to get the guys. Oh, you can't win, Americans. <laughs> yeah, let me show you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because Washington's War, the mechanics appear simple, and oh my gosh, I just got isolated, mm. and mm -hmm. and everything gets pulled off. Hands in the sea doesn't. You the card mechanics are simple, but doesn't appear as simple. Yeah. So you you're not tempted to do to do something. You might be more cautious. You're not tempted to do something stupid. Whereas uh, you know the the tactical games, you really I mean that's you get if you have a feel for tactical games. You know even though I'm not I've I've played Band mm -hmm. of Brothers, uh, Conflict of Heroes, Conflict of Heroes, Advanced Squad Leader, Upfront, Combat Commander. You know, there's probably I know, lock and load. Oh yeah. I mean, I've played them all. So once you understand, you you can transfer that knowledge between the games. But you're right. Uh, against a new player, the you know, unless they've played Go, yeah, Washington's War will be an unfor can be an unfortunate well, experience. Well, it's also this that. I so rarely play really, really good Washington's Wars players. There's a guy who used to play on Vassal, and he was going to WBC all the time. And he and I would have, man, we'd have epic duels. Mm. And um, one time he said, I was kind of like a sparring partner. I said, hey, I need to brush up on stuff. Can we play again? And I took it. And I was like, sure. I go, which side are you weak with? He said, the British. I said, okay, I'll take the Americans. First move, I get all these one cards. I take Washington. I go out and clobber that guy in Detroit mm. just to push the French meter. I was like, Wow, I never even thought of that move. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I he's like, I'm, uh, oh. I'm a proud boy. He's going out there and going to whoop some people. You know, my that that's cool. Yeah, you can just overrun them. Yeah, and um, so um, <laughs> so I love playing with him. But most people, it was always people wanting me to teach him how to play. And so, you know, I'd take the British and I'd go work the whole Southern strategy and clobber them and they'd be hopelessly lost while I got all my colonies secure. Then they'd, or I'd get the guy that says, oh, you can't win with the Americans. Oh, really? Well, you yeah, take exactly. the British. Let me show you. Oh, yeah. Because they think you've got to line them up and fight just like the British. Like, no, that's an asymmetrical game for a reason. 
Yeah. So I love it when I get to play really good players in that game. There's a guy who's always wanted to play me at BGG Con. He has Borat as his, as his avatar. So sometime we're going to hook up when I'm down there. Cool. All right. All right. Hemtag. Hemtag. We're out of here. Have a good one. See ya.